Good evening. Welcome to SciArc. Uh, I'm glad to see such a nice big crowd. Um, I'm Todd Gannon. I teach here in the, in the school, and it is really my great pleasure tonight to introduce our guest from afar, uh, Jose Ubrary. Um, Jose is a modest man, and uh, last night he told me that I shouldn't give the standard biographical lecture or introduction. Um, the truth is, given his you know, legendary pedigree, which we all know, um, that kind of introduction isn't really necessary. Um, nonetheless, I think for some, of the, uh, for some of the students, it would make sense to, uh, to just review uh, a couple of the highlights of his resume. Um, along with the late Julian de la Fuente and Alain Tavez, José was among the last members of the Atelier Le Corbusier in Paris. Uh, he joined the studio in 1957 to work on the site of the Bra Brazil Pavilion and went on to collaborate with Corbu on numerous projects including the Unité d'Habitation in Fermini, the Venice Hospital, the Strasbourg Convention Hall, and the Hotel d'Orsay in Paris. And I found these pictures, so I figured I would show them to you. Um, <clears throat> after the Corbusier's, the Corbusier's death in 1965, José went on to realize the Heidi Weber Pavilion in Zurich in 1967 to reconstruct the Esprit Nouveau Pavilion in Bologna in 1977, and most famously to complete the design and construction of the Church of Saint Pierre in Fermini in 2006. Here's just some more pictures. <clears throat> so, Jose's contributions to the Oeuvre Complete alone would be enough to secure his place in the history of modern architecture. And this, in a strange way, is, is kind of unfortunate. Uh, I, I say this because Jose's close association with Le Corbusier has a tendency to overshadow in, in some small way the brilliance of his own built works, uh, in particular the French cultural set center in Damascus, which he completed in 1986, and the extraordinary Miller House in Lexington, Kentucky, which he completed in collaboration with Cicely Wilde Ubry in 1992. Now in these projects, Jose swerves his Corbusian training in daring new directions. When you study them, you'll see that he, was, that he was and remains unperturbed by the anxiety of influence that plagued so many neo-Corbusians of his generation, even though José was working in far closer proximity to the master. In the Miller House, for example, you'll find unabashedly Corbusian elements placed into distinct tension with American vernacular constructions, cunning appropriations from sources that range from Alberti to the arts and crafts, and other tactics one would be hard pressed to locate in Le Corbusier's own portfolio. Jose's small but impressive body of work has earned him a laundry list of awards. They've come from the AIA, the French Ministry of Culture, the French Academy of Architecture, and elsewhere. Uh, in 2009, he was made a chevalier uh, by the French Ministry of Culture. So, I, do you have a sword now? Um, <laughs> now, for all this, all this, Jose's greatest contribution to contemporary architecture culture, I would say, comes from his teaching. At the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, at the Politecnico di Milano, the Cooper Union, the New York Institute of Technology, Columbia University, the, the University of Kentucky, and the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State, Jose has proven himself one of the field's great teachers. And generations of students from these schools, myself and many in the audience, would eagerly attest to this. Now, unlike many teachers, Jose's instruction and criticism is entirely devoid of complex jargon and long-winded theoretical justifications. Perhaps it has something to do with his distinctive and carefully maintained accent, but Jose tends to deliver his criticism in a kind of sliding scale of single word pronouncements. Uh, many of Jose's former students in the audience will remember that the best projects were simply fantastique, and the worst ones were labeled Terrible. Now, if you were on the right track with Jose, he'd let you know by telling you it's pretty good. And most, office, most of the time, you would hear his famous tagline, it could be good, but, but you must do work. And so in these kinds of pronouncements, this is how we were taught at OSU. And I, I would call Jose's technique a kind of teaching by doing. And I think it's really important to, to lay this out. Uh, in my studio with him, we built this large site model. You know, it was like four by eight feet or something. And three of us set to work on various areas of it with small chipboard constructions. As the models proliferated, large piles of scraps and rejected pieces were produced. 
These we kept in a big cardboard box underneath the table. And when Jose would come to studio, he'd sit down in your chair, he'd look carefully at the model, and then he would say, bring me the books. He'd then root through the box for bits and pieces he could use to make improvements, sometimes even tearing bits of your neighbor's model to be reattached, inevitably in a different orientation, to somebody else's project. And it was here that the real teaching took place. For while few words were exchanged, we students were exposed to a brilliant eye and the expert hand at work. He instantly saw everything you were trying to do, and after a few minutes of Jose's surgical revisions, latent possibilities would be seized and exploited, formal complexities would be cleaned up and intensified, and our clumsy piles of cardboard would begin to come to life. And inevitably, just as things were getting good, he'd stop, he'd put down his scissors, he'd turn to you and he would say, you see, it could be good, but you must do work. Now, I realized that, that later, you know, now 15 years later, thinking back to these crits and trying to figure out what he was doing, I, I now think I, I got it. And I, I realized it was a, really a kind of cunning act of intellectual generosity. Jose would lay down just enough of the hints to keep you going, but he'd never take the easy way out and just hand you the answer. A crit from Jose was always a provocation. He'd demonstrate that what you were doing could be done, but in the end, he'd leave it up to you to discover and deliver the coup de grace. Now, I could go on and on and on about with stories like these, and I know a lot of people in the audience have them, but I just wanted to close with this. One of the most famous chapters in Le Corbusier's Vers une architecture is called Des yeux qui ne voyons pas, which is eyes which do not see. And when Le Corbusier met José over half a century ago, I'm pretty sure he saw a dapper young painter in possession of yeux que voyons beaucoup. Those all-seeing eyes, which have since led José to produce some of the most impressive works in re recent history, were what most impressed me when I was his student, and they're the driving force behind the work that you'll see tonight. And with that, please help me welcome José Ubrey. So I pushed that. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of, yeah. you know, fancy technology. Okay, uh, thank you first to invite me uh, here in uh, Saya. I think it's a great school, and uh, I am pleased to be here. And um, I like the new building. I came a long time ago in the old building. Where the only difference was that the, the creativity of the student was stimulated by the possibility of building inside the school. I remember there were some kind of stories about that were interesting. But otherwise, I think this is a great building for the school of architecture. So, um, despite uh, the photograph that Todd show you. I'm a little bit older than here. I don't recognize myself in this photograph, and also because I took a different size. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's just, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about some project. Um, George Brack used to say, the object is a poetic. The poetics, if you want, in English. And uh, uh, I think it's exactly what interests me in architecture. It's the process of making an object. It's the process of uh, slowly building up. If you want you building a project is, is building with ideas and, and form and drawings and everything and bring that all together. And, uh, but it's a slow construction and mostly a construction of concepts. Uh, before the formal aspect of the thing. And uh, that for me is a very important thing. Um, the other thing is because I believe in that, it's, it's very difficult for me to make projects for nothing or for invent projects, hypothetical projects. So I cannot make a project un unless I am working for something concrete and real. 
So it's why my production is made be. I have friends who make one project a day, even if they never build it. Uh, other, uh, like me, uh, have a much smaller production. I will try to explain to you the Bosch ways. I mean, uh, we made this kind of machine here, which I hope is going to work. And um, um, I will show first uh, uh, how much time I have. No, I don't know. When people start to leave, it's finished. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, to show first uh, the shares of Fermini, because this is my part of my education, strange education, which took much longer than I was hoping, because I started the project which Corbusier gave me the first drawing to do in 1960. Uh, we built in 1970 a piece of it, and in we started in 2003 uh, to finish in 2006, uh, really the construction. So it's, it's something which has been with me all the way long of, from 1960 to recently, and it's a strange thing, mostly when you have to restart and uh, have the same freshness uh, that you had at the beginning, but if you cultivate architecture, you are always fresh, which is good even if you get older in age. And uh, another project would be, uh, I, I start to build, as I said, a few times after Corbusier died. And this was in the uh, following, if you want, the death of Corbusier, was a, a natural uh, event happening. and. Uh, uh, we were at this time also working on uh, finishing the plan of uh, the hospital of Venice in, uh, with uh, my friend uh, Guillermo Julian de la Fuente. And we were uh, working uh, uh, to finish uh, all the project with an enormous amount of work. And uh, so we were really st still um, in the studio, in the prolongation of the studio. Uh, it became much more difficult uh, when I had to restart a uh, long time after that. We were talking before about, uh, with Zago and Todd, of architect who had been working in Corbusier's office or, or uh, Fangeri office, and uh, we were with, when they were leaving the office, they were doing, uh, prolongating the, the period where I've been leaving. Uh, I had this chance uh, with Julian and some other. Uh, we were the last one to work, so we had really to invent how we were going to continue. We did not have Corbusier to do that. Um, also to conclude with that, um, yeah, I'm a kind of old dinosaur of architecture, you know. It's, it's a kind of category which disappeared. Uh, uh, unfortunately unfort or unfortunately, because all the young people do very interesting stuff. So I show you the, the shares, I show you, um, uh, yeah, I, I want to say uh, also just this thing. Um, what I did not realize when I started to work in the 70s and start to build the church, the how difficult it was. And when I restarted in 2003, um, uh, it was really a uh, very difficult thing to to do, and uh, <coughs> that that uh, the thing. So uh, quickly, um, this is the the studio of uh, Rutsev, which you, you will never see again because it's been destroyed. And this is as quickly I show you some important element. This is. Uh, Corbusier on the, on the site looking for a site. And the result of this uh, exploration was those drawings, um, which sketch that he would make on the site to define the position of the building. And um, after that, uh, he had a all a collection of unbuilt projects. And um, I, he, he gave me that one of the first drawings that he gave me. 
was a, 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 stu a study for a church in, in Le Tremblay uh, near Paris. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's a big prism and uh, you have a ramp going around and you enter in, the, in front of the altar and the square, squ square church. Uh, uh, close to that is, uh, for example, the church of La Tourette that he realized in the 50s. And uh, the, the project of Le Tremblay corresponds at this period of the 30s, where that, for example, is a, one of the first drawings of Le Corbusier as a, as a painter, as an artist, where he's very interested both by uh, the cube and uh, by the reflection and uh, uh, on, on the marble of the, of the chimney. But it's exactly that. The other thing he gave me were uh, some sketches from his uh, trip in, uh, in, uh, in, in Orient in 1910. Uh, this is Hagia Sophia, where he was very interested by the cupola of Hagia Sophia. You know, it's a very curious thing because you have an enormous cupola in stone with a fantastic, uh, you know, thing here to maintain the thing, and you have this series of little windows, and what Corbusier, uh, buttresses, excuse me, and what Corbusier was interested in was in the fact that these little windows were making the, this enormous amount of stone uh, like a very light uh, element suspended in, in the sky. and. Uh, uh, this was also interesting by the movement of the sun around uh, the church, which also, uh, why, it's why he gave me also this uh, drawing, this photograph of, of Stonehenge, which has the same problem of orientation, of uh, uh, following the, the course of the sun, and uh, has also more astrological and astronomical uh, uh, connotation. Uh, after this was the first project that was drawn on a table, a, a piece of ta table cloth of restaurant in paper. And so you have the square church and the section and so on. So this uh, also was the location of the, of the building uh, in this site in uh, Firmini with the stadium and the uh, Youth club and so on, and uh, the studies started, and uh, the studies became uh, exploration about the, the, uh, the shape of the building, which at this time was the projection of uh, because Corbusier you had done, uh, if you want, the, the building in. Uh, in Le Tremblay was corresponding to the first, uh, if you're plastic aesthetic of the Corbusier of the 30s. In between, he had done uh, the paraboloid of revolution, hyperboloid of revolution in, in, uh, in Chandigarh. And um, so there was a kind of shift in, uh, plastic shift in, uh, in his, uh, uh, operation uh, is in his aesthetic if you want and so the, the idea of uh, was to find and this was expressed also uh, a little bit in this drawing to find a, a, a new uh, type of form for the thing this was a projection of a, a, an ellipse on a square the problem that you, you had some, uh, in, it was producing some inflection that we could not do technically at this time uh, because uh, the, the, the way to make concrete was, you know, there's a projection of all the things. And uh, the technique of the concrete would not, would make that very difficult. The other idea also was this was, you know, being perceived as a, as a circle this way and you had a kind of, of 
possibility of seeing this like a circle when it was an ellipse by the projections. And um, uh, it's called anamorphosis uh, normally. And um, it was uh, also a kind of symbolic thing of uh, uh, the, the square being representing uh, the earth and the circle representing the sky. It was also a kind of symbolic way. There are different uh, complicated ideas in the idea of the, in the, of the building because uh, for Cobbesis was also to make a little bit is uh, Saint Pierre de Rome. Uh, so the, the other drawing here is studies for the, the, uh, the structure. And the project now has a kind of evolution uh, that I showed you in several of the images. Uh, before that, uh, this drawing, for example, was also very important because, uh, you know, Ronchamp, you have the shell like that, you have the walls, and you have this little, um, you know, opening here, which <coughs> make the, the shell of the roof uh, visible. You know, the light enters this way, and um, the, uh, you have the famous wall and all that. Uh, <coughs> so the, uh, Firmini is a contrary. You have a, a shell this way, and at the bottom, Kobizi wanted the light entering by the top, by the bottom. And was giving, uh, yeah, was giving a more sense of community uh, for a parochial church. This was, a, you know, Ronchamp is is this way. I mean, uh, you have uh, the chapel here, but the, the real church is outside for the pilgrim, which go outside. Here is a, it's a, the contrary is an enclosed thing for a parochial. Uh, church and uh, you have to have a kind of sense of community. Uh, the other thing was to bring the light, you know, from, from, from the roof and trying to, to find some connotation with different moments of, in uh, uh, the liturgy of the church. And it was very difficult because it never worked. So we abandoned that. So this is uh, the first project uh, with Corbusier. After we reconsidered the project uh, another time, you know, we were working like, because we were three people in the studio and we did a lot of work. Uh, all the, the complete work from 57 to 65, we were, we were done in three people. Uh, and our way of working was interesting for that. So what we were saying that when we reached this, this stage, the project would go in, a, we would say, in the refrigerator. And uh, we would work on other things. And after that, I came back to this, this stage. And um, it was giving the freshness to reconsider uh, what had been done. And here is another stage of the project that we present to the mayor, which is somewhere there. I don't see the button. Okay, and so and so. So, um, and finally, uh, when do you find a lot, when do you fix things? You know, so the first thing was uh, the de development of, of the shell. The second idea was the bringing the light to light up the floor for the community. The, the third thing was bringing the light in different places uh, to animate the shell itself, but protecting this kind of uh, shadow things. In fact, the effect would be something like that. And um, the other was researching the uh, exact uh, uh, idea for uh, the um, different elements. So, for example, if we have the, in the section, we had uh, these three images show an evolution in the research of the, the, the bell tower, which finally become the prolongation of the 
slab which makes the, the top of the church and become a natural event uh, in the church. So you see the drawing become a creative uh, way to find, uh, define things. It's not that, you see here the Corbusier had a very strange idea to make a support for put uh, bells and so on, until it comes to this kind of architectural connection, uh, a structural connection to the way the, the building is made, and find the, the, the form of it. And that the final another drawing. So we were co communicating every day through these different little drawings. I mean, it was which I call in a certain way ideograms. I mean, <laughs> we're discussing the possible, uh, the way the possible thing could become. And um, one day I did this model because we had to reduce the, the number of floor and so on. It's always a problem of money. And um, I, had, uh, I had done um, um, we, we were trying to, to put uh, in the first project in the first project, uh, the, the main church was here and the chapel was underneath. So we could uh, communicate visually between the chapel and after we had an, another level of uh, classes and so on. So we had to get rid of one level and, and so in plan, I started, we had the altar here, I started to put a, a level here and with a ramp and so on. And finally, in working with the model, came the idea to connect the two things together and make people entering underneath, going up, up and up, and have this kind of spiral effect that you can see here. So this was giving also that people here could see the our main altar, the main altar, and the people in the, that was becoming the chapel and they could also see the, the main altar. So it was working with a different, you know, number of people uh, during the, the week. So this transforms our, in a drawing. And that's the final model. Uh, this is 1965, called Bizier in front of, and it's how I, I stay with the project. Uh, that was uh, what was built, uh, the, the site of the thing. Another building was made starting with the Unité in Fermini. And um, we did this model to show where the, the church was located. And um, these drawings represent in a certain way a kind of analysis of, of the, and a kind of report about reporting about the different elements which constitute the church and the site um, because we were reducing uh, this floor we made a kind of bottom street you could cross the because it was a public building you could cross the thing um, the discovery of the, the element the different element uh, coming from outside and entering under the balcony and discovering uh, the high space and uh, uh, the program, which was in the mesh, is not very difficult. You have, uh, you know, the, the bread and the, the wine, uh, which are shared on the table, which is the altar. With this kind of different thing is that the altar here, because the church was elevated, the altar. Um, uh, uh, Dominican told me that. Uh, the altar should touch the ground or have a kind of incrustation of a stone inside of it. So I decided to have the altar going down and uh, on the ground. That's the story of the double level. Uh, this progression from outside to the inside of the building. There was a the re reason for the cut which was bringing the, the, the water, the rain down, connecti collecting the rain and sending one. So the, the rain become a kind of poetical element. 
And uh, this is a more funny idea, is um, when we are at this moment, this cut, because they told me this is a, the mountain in front of my house where I was going with my, my father to climb the, the, this mountain. And he said the other thing was, was very interesting was the helmet of the German soldier of the 1914, 46, uh, 56, 16, 14, 16 war, uh, which has this kind of thing on the top. And he said, we have to finish this, this church, and this was we had the cannon, and, and so on. So that's a different profile of the, the, the building, the geometry, the, the possible development for construction and uh, uh, cones and plants. And the most important was bringing the light uh, to the building by the cannon and by this disposition, which was uh, very important because at the beginning, the first drawing of Corbusier was to have the, a bench uh, with the glass here and uh, the lighting somewhere here. And, um, but the problem is that people could sit on this bench around and, uh, uh, you know, depending on how they were dressed or if they were, it could be a very disturbing spectacle. Uh, uh, you know, some people have, have the legs like that and they have a lot of hair. <laughs> you know, that for the big guy which is here and after you have a little woman dressed on the side. You know, so, so this was, was becoming a uh, I have nothing against this different typology of humans, <laughs> but they were becoming, uh, there was no dog uh, by chance, you know, uh, because in the church they are not permitted. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I explained that to Gabriel, and he said, yes, well, you are right, what do we do? We, so we bring it, we bring this thing at one, six feet here, and um, we cut that by a plan, and uh, we, which allowed us first to collect the water here, we, to have the glass here and uh, a system of light for the night. And, uh, and this was going to run around. Uh, evidently, there are places where, uh, I guess, uh, this is too small. It's, uh, all, all well, the paper is too big. The thing is too big. Now that, that was interesting because, and I would tell you, this was my real lesson of architecture: is that I did that, I designed that, and uh, I had made this. I mean, because we, we, as I told you, we were not executed in. Uh, in this studio, we are supposed to invent things also and react to what we were discussing with Corbusier. <coughs> and in fact, is why he was coming every morning at our time, and uh, uh, he was. We were discussing the project, and, and we would work all the afternoon for that. So this was the actual idea for the thing. And Kobuzi come and said the morning after, I said, you know something that if you do that, because we have to evidently to have the loads of the shell going down, uh, we are going to have this uh, like a dotted line. So he said, uh, let's do this. So what this does, is that if I take, you know, this, these two lines, uh, I have the same thing. I have from time to time this piece and that piece and that piece. And, and the light was going to be continuous. So it's a, it's a complete, you know, the, the, it's really doing that. And that was very important. This for me was my best lesson of architecture with him.
I, I understood the, the substation of, of detailing. So that's the result. And uh, that's the result too. And this is a um, drawing I did to try to figure out the effects that would be realized <coughs> excuse me, in the, the building. And at the top above the altar, we are uh, going to, to replace the, the, uh, the, the, the big window of the cathedral, gothical cathedral. We would have a constellation uh, in, uh, above the main altar. So, and we had, so on one hand, we had this, uh, this light running around and following the, the spiral floor. I mean, that is also very important. And uh, here we had the cannon stop, and this would be the result. So these are some first models we did uh, in the 70s. And um, that's the image of the first construction. And uh, uh, in 2003, we were confronted to this problem that uh, uh, in Florence they had for Santa Maria dei Fiori how to make the cupola. And so we were at this point and we had to add you know, this piece and they had to add this piece. And as you know, we didn't ask you to find the solution. Uh, we had another problem is that in the 70s, this was a technique that was used to build the church. You know, the forms were made on the site, the, the workers were putting the, uh, the, the, the rods and everything on the site and so on. And um, suddenly we were in a complete different thing. You know, these are uh, all the uh, pieces of cones uh, for each level of construction in concrete, which were made with a CNC machine and blah, blah, blah. It was great because as an architect and with our drawings, uh, computer drawings, we were practically directly in connection with the formal, re with the realization of the building and of the casting of mm -hmm. everything. So this were technical problem which were uh, different from, from the past. Now we had another one which was uh, because the land was at uh, a certain uh, capacity, quality, uh, the underground, we, we had to make a big platform, a big square platform, uh, which would, uh, this would be about uh, one meter forty high, which is about this this high, you know, and so the the, the bottom floor of the the bottom uh, the bottom floor here would be with these walls of one forty around. That. So I thought about the, the bulletarium in uh, Priene, uh, where you had these these uh, steps running around. This was for uh, the Senate, I think. And uh, also, you, uh, Miss did in uh, Chicago uh, a convention center, uh, which was also with steps all around. And uh, here, we, I decided to do that and to make steps everywhere which were running around. And that makes that we could bring the, the ground directly at this level and have the, the, the canal for the water outside and the glass here. So it was a kind of way to bring the uh, continuity uh, between the outside and inside. And this model show uh, part of that. Here is the upper floor, but you can see the, the thing running around. And it was a kind of like a, an old castle, you know, the Sherman Room. And, um, that was, you see the platform here and the support, all that part was built and we built this one in the, uh, after that, that's the geometry. So you, you can imagine the importance of, of making the casting 
uh, by uh, with CNC and uh, well defined um, because uh, the different side had a different inclination, so different thickness in concrete. So you had to connect sometimes a smaller thing to a bigger thing. So the the two curves here were totally different. It was not just you know the translation of the same geometry from from this side to that side. This was the other fantastic thing was uh, I briefly talk about this technology, but the other fantastic thing was the use of uh, uh, the self-leveling concrete, plastic concrete, which is absolutely fantastic. I had only one question. I said, what happened to the, the stones inside the concrete? You know, if you inject that, because, you know, you put, uh, we would do one level of three meters 75 each day a complete rain in one morning. So they were pouring the thing once the form were in place, you know, once the, the, the steel was in place, they were pouring the thing and there was only one guy and two trucks and he had an electric thing and, psh, 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 and he was making sure that everything was going up at the same level. It was a fantastic thing. But I was wondering about the stones inside, and he said the plasticity is, is, has, a, has been studied in a way that uh, they re remain suspended. They are great. So you see that the finishing of the building. You imagine the, the type of work. I like it very much. Is, uh, here they are suspended to the crane, and this was my favorite tour of the building to see what happened, um, because the, the crane would tour me all around and inside the, the, the things. This was very interesting. My assistant could not do it. He, he was vomiting. <laughs> it was to you. Uh, so this is the plan, the collage for the plan, some elements of the plan. Uh, the discussion I had, because I was working from Columbus and going four days and months in uh, Saint Etienne where I was working, um, we were exchanging constantly information through uh, scan, plan, everything. That was fantastic, and now it's the same bit. That's the bottom part you are going to see quickly. At the street inside, I told you before, that one moment I was the uh, building, that the cannon at the top, which were also prefabricated and by enormous element and put in place, like this thing was put in place in one piece, prefabricated on the ground. This was 35 tons. I mean, it was very interesting the way. Uh, you build with concrete now because it's a kind of assemblage of, of things. It's not everything, you know, solidified together. So this is a system, the water going down, going up, down, down, protecting the window which turn around, and some views of the inside. And slowly, which that this cannon bring the light to above the altar at a certain time. This is the constellation of Orion, which is below this uh, rib here. This is some uh, what produced uh, the entrance box and, and so on. The main door that uh, Kipnis uh, find a connection of that uh, because I use smart, how do you say, tall emaille, uh, metal, uh, the, the paint is cooked in, uh, in, uh, in an oven, uh, enamel uh, steel. Um, and so this looks like a painting of Kelly uh, in the past, which is, he found exactly the, the painting, which I was very pleased, because it was my intention to be 
and connection with contemporary art. And this is where the inside you enter, as I say. Here you discover the, the balcony and these are some effect of the well produced uh, And this was very funny because it was a kind of surprise, as you would say, that uh, to make the stars of the uh, constellation of Orion were three, three different diameter of stars and which were corresponding to the dimension of the way you see the stars. But we could not do that in, in glass, in the concrete, because in this part of concrete is the, the, the seeker is about 31 uh, foot here, you know. So we had to put a polycarbonate uh, cylinder um, inside that, which were glued to the concrete, but could resist more or less to the move in the concrete. And this produced at certain moment, you see this kind of uh, effect here. You would see more of that. Uh, yeah, here. See that? See what what happened here? Uh, this happened uh, for a brief period of time. Normally, you get oh, normally you get this this spot of of light, but at one moment, for a brief moment, uh, this happened, and it's absolutely a fantastic thing. Um, This is the project as it is now. And this is the team uh, by order of size and, and uh, that uh, uh, Aline, uh, Yves, uh, Romain and myself. Okay, so uh, the thing is that I told you I was surprised that uh, I discovered when I did the building and the second time how difficult it was. And by chance I had, I benefited uh, to the experience of two at least uh, big buildings in concrete, which were the, the Damascus, uh, uh, the Damascus Center of uh, Cultural Center. I don't know what happened to it now. It may be closed which is a little building with an enormous space inside. And uh, uh, you know, the, the, the thing was that um, what you were seeing in Damascus was so terrible outside that I decided to make a building to which look at itself. And is why I created this, uh, the big space. Evidently, the the ambassador, when he saw this space, he said, why we don't make floors here? They are very sensitive to architecture. Um, the other thing was the exploration of a kind of continuous surface, which would be perceived, perceived inside the building. For example, here was the entrance, the floor, the, the main facade. This wall was turned around and create. So there was a kind of of movement of creating the the and 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 the facade. I draw that this way, but uh, so you had you had the, the same plane which which was moving everywhere and and becoming a roof a facade and so on. So it was a kind of interesting thing to do that this model. So it was a way to escape the, the type of spaces, uh, Corbusian space also, to make something more uh, in accord with the research about the new topological possibilities. I showed you two or three projects like that, and after, quickly, and after uh, the Miller had. This is another project I did in Cleveland, which was not built, evidently. I was fired. 
I had to escape the idea of a uh, uh, very tiny site in size here and very long. And um, the Middle Ours is a kind of medieval city. This was more like a village street with all the different elements. You see, you were entering here the, the room for the kids, the parents, the living room, working space, and so and so. And uh, I had this idea also that how I do that, I mean, all the rooms which were uh, permanent for sleeping and things like that, I said uh, there would be a, a sedentary, sedentary people uh, in a certain way. And uh, this was expressed by a vault and an opening uh, roof here uh, for the, uh, the nomadic space. So this is express here, you see, you have the bedroom and clothes and so on, and here you have the nomadic space. And this was one of the results of, this is one of uh, several, you know, I make a project in, that's another stage of the project. The other one nomad, you know, the thing gets fixed and the, that's an, another project quickly. Uh, my origin were the, the market in Seattle, which is a long building like this school. And uh, the structure of the highways uh, in that area, which uh, you have some very beautiful ones. And it was a museum for uh, Switzerland, for Geneva, with three different museums, which were in three different levels. And, uh, 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 the Italian president of the jury was very good. Uh, you had Ben van Berkel and company in this competition, and myself, and uh, the 15 first to win were 15 of his former student Italian. So this was a very absurd competition. Anyway, this is the project. And uh, this for Jago, it was an addition to a building, uh, you know, that was made, was an old building, an architect of Columbus had made this building, and the woman wanted a kitchen, but she wanted a kitchen where she could teach cooking inside. So I did this, this piece outside of it. Yeah, I says I go because he has a, a prison like that in his office, which is very nice. And, um, my uh, inspiration, if you want, came from the kind of farm system for the material which exists in that area. And for the kitchen of Fontevraud, which is an abbey uh, near, uh, in Touraine, and, uh, um, which is uh, are isolated from, from the abbey because of fire possibilities. So uh, this you could, you know, cook uh, a complete cow, cow in each of these things. Uh, it was an enormous thing for, you know, the, the monks uh, eat, eat very well in France. They drink, they make courvoisier, they make a lot of things. And this was also very important for me, this culture of Giacometti, which is also dealing with this kind of, of problem. And, uh, that was the result, was like a little Fermini church. And uh, uh, you see it was connected by a bridge here and you had a terrace uh, in this part. And now the last thing, uh, uh, middle house. This is the, uh, the oak plantation, oaky plantation in Louisiana. Uh, when I was asked to make this house, it was in the middle of a big site of 30 acres. And um, I, I, I absolutely dislike suburbs, and it was surrounded by suburbs. And um, I went back to the idea of the mansion. I did this collage, uh, you know, the, the invention of the portico here was a very important feature at one moment. Uh, before the air conditioning, which killed the particle. And 
I was using concrete also, so concrete is like chocolate cake, you know, you, you push out chocolate in a, in a mold and you, you make things like that. And it was related also, this is a painting by Vasarelli, but which explain a kind of layering and uh, Zago, you would like that to uh, effect, you know, I mean, you, you never know exactly if you are in the same plane or if you are in a diagonal or if you are, right, it's a, there's some interesting uh, optical effect also. But this idea of layering for me was very important. And uh, I expressed that also, this is Richard Serra, uh, but you see, for example, for me, I wanted to dislocate facades and windows and so on. And uh, for example, if this was an element of facade and this is a window, you could see the facade from outside and from inside. And I wanted to do that for everything. So, the house was like a, that's the diagram of it, is like a medieval city. You have three houses inside of a, a, a wall, you know, the wall is in concrete, the houses are in metal and, and wood. Um, this is a church in the form of Romanum, which also gave me this type of, of, of idea, which, because I, I am interested also to uh, relate to things that I discover in the reality of, uh, of the, or, or in architecture in a certain way. Uh, this is a Baroque church which uh, was built in a, a temple uh, which is on the Forum Roman. So these are some ideas from, for the, for the, the section, the, the houses, and the, that's the first drawing, you know, all the diagrams. And the result was very much that. I mean, you have a complete floor, which is three, which is not here, and you have uh, three houses and with two, f two floors each and uh, surrounded by uh, uh, a wall, which is complex. This, for example, a model of one of the houses, where I wanted to integrate the furniture, stairs, everything. And uh, <coughs> we start to build. This was in a very interesting process because at the time, uh, we had all these models where we were studying different things. And uh, what I, I liked very much was I was dean at the school uh, in uh, Kentucky and I had not so much time to make the drawing. So we were designing one piece after the other. We did a piece, all the pieces in concrete and after, and it was like working, improvising each time, knowing what you wanted to do, but in the same time, uh, responding directly to the new condition of the site. In fact, like when you build, um, we are building a, a castle or whatever. So we had a great freedom to, to do things. Yeah, we had some reference. This was a, a kind of homage to Richard Serra, uh, this type of stair at the main entrance. And you see one of the houses totally suspended, and this is the main facade, the west wall. And uh, my client, uh, Miller, one, one day told me, but Jose, why, why the, the house here does not touch the, the main facade? I said, this is not, it's not a facade, it's a, it's a metaphor of a facade. And he said, uh, as a lawyer, it's the most expensive metaphor that I ever paid. <laughs> it was just $15,000 at the time. Today would be more. <laughs> this is the house of the sun. You can see express the two level of it, the elevator um, and so so, the entrance. And now everything has joined. You know, I had this idea. Uh, to contradict completely all the theory of uh, alignment and uh, 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 connections that I have learned with Corbusier. Well, can, uh, if uh, Syria was a, a, a kind of uh, 
discussion with the, the problematic of space. Here it was a discussion with Corbusier about the, the way of making, uh, connecting things. So here it, you have joints, for example, everywhere. You have uh, all the pieces are, are fragmented and uh, clearly defined. And uh, this is what what you get. You get what, you know, some deformation, but I like this photograph. They make the building more interesting. Is that the, the deconstructed facade, if you want? Where here, everything happened as it happened from outside. It's like as if you open your stomach and something gets out and you don't, because all the other facades are very composed when this one is not composed. So it was a kind of also way to, uh, you see this is separated from that, from that, from that. I mean, it, it's a very, it's four years of work because we were doing all the drawing at the same time and asking ourselves how we do the next step. It's what well maintain your freshness of a, so I put that because it was on the poster. So it's the drawing for the garden, which is uh, on the side of the house here. Uh, this is the main portico uh, type uh, mansion, American mansion and the Corbusian facade, if you want. Facade. And these are views on the inside now. And see the, the joint also, the, everything is separated. The, the, so it was really a kind of exercise, of an exploration of, of a linguistic exploration of things and how to relate, even if they have Corbusian connotation. <coughs> and w another thing that I find interesting, you know, the modern houses have always been uh, uh, this, uh, called uh, too easy to understand and too easy, too clearly made and too clearly uh, uh, seen and uh, not so much mystery. and. Uh, that was one of the things I wanted to create in these hours, is uh, the such complexity that you would not know, and recognize, you would recognize the language, but you would not recognize the orientation, uh, the same everywhere, the same. And I think the fact to avoid, you know, the, the main problem for me was, uh, you know, the usual house is a, a garage, Two car, three car, I did a house in Long Island, three car, 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 uh, I don't know, enormous, uh, absurd. Um, uh, you have the pantry, the kitchen, uh, here you have uh, some type of entrance, the dining room can be here or there, the living room is here, uh, or you have a stair to go to the bedroom. <coughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's always the same thing, I mean, it, this is, it can be absolutely, I, I did not want it to do that, well, I say, okay, I am for freedom, I am for, uh, there's nothing ter most terrible when you are young, I don't know if you have experienced that, but one of my generation, I mean, you know, when you are in a thing like that, if you want to leave, and your family has some people you don't want to see, you are about to say, oh, and then, and then, and you know, and so I say, okay, pick kids, one exit here, on the main facade. Parents here, they have their, their library, oh, they have their own exit here. So it's a maison, a house full of doors, there are six or seven or eight doors entrance doors, everything is, and, and it, it's, the, the other thing is the expression of the three axes by the roof, by the transparency sometimes, the transparency is not made with glasses, it's made with opening, but this opening or percourse that you have in the, do in the house from one point to the other, or from one view to the other, or from the 
presence of the sky, uh, are a completely different way to express the three-dimensionality, the three axes of X, Y, Z. So uh, that uh, the kid on the, the kid has the, the sun. At the upper floor of the houses, so the, you, you have three floors in the house. This house has a, a, a big and enormous internal space. Yeah, I realized at one moment that the, the three houses were connecting here, and that the, uh, the balcony, the, the portico here, uh, you could go there. So we had a kitchen here, a kitchenette, and a sink, so they could meet together here. So that's another thing to give multi possibilities uh, to uh, people. You see, you could get out here. And, uh, and I realized one day it was 90 degrees in, in uh, Lexington. And uh, I said, oh my god, the portico might be a terrible thing. But the fact that it was detached from, from the house, made that the hair was circulating everywhere. I don't know anything about uh, sustainable, this word makes me sick, but sustainable, but I was sustainable here, you know? It was pretty good. We were sustainable long before that. Corbusier was the first sustainable uh, with the cross ventilation, the gardens. You see that today, oh my God, you do a garden roof, wow. My God, the lack of lack of knowledge of education is terrible. <laughs> so this you could eat there, you know. And the curious thing is that the bottom floor was related to the side, the direct side, which was enclosed by trees. So the second floor was related to that side, and the third floor was related too far away to the, the tower of the city. So you had each time also, by going up, different uh, possibilities of, of work. At the night, it expressed better the, the joint. This piece is totally independent from the concrete. It's, on, on wheels here, when it touched the concrete. That is the escape of the kids, the entrance. <coughs> well, someone gave to the client these, uh, these uh, what are the names, these white birds? Uh, uh? Yeah, they, you know, they, they are terrible, they, they, they are long thing like that. <laughs> and uh, one day, uh, one day, Peter as a man one day told me, he said, you know, I was in a plane, and uh, a guy was looking at photographs, and um, I said, well, I know these houses, it's, uh, it's just a very uh, little house, and blah, blah, blah. And the guy said, yes, and you see, I gave this bird to, to me there. These birds are terrible. You come here and they absolutely want to. <laughs> you cannot es escape. <laughs> okay. So I am done. For now, I don't want to bother you more. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer. Uh, I regret, uh, you know, we invited in Columbus once. Uh, Columbus was a. Uh, Wexner Prize was given to Rosenberg. And Rosenberg was fantastic because he was drinking all the time. So he had always, he was talking, he had a glass of white wine. He received the Wexner Prize with Les Wexner, he was drinking white wine. He talked to the student. We had to have a special permit to have him drinking in front of the student. And he was drinking all the time. Uh, he died, unfortunately, but he was fantastic. I mean, so I recall drinking sometime to my student what uh, Todd was saying. 
when I was still really constipated, I said, drink some whiskey, you know, bourbon, <laughs> a big glass of bourbon, and uh, keep going. <laughs> okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>